Well, we started out in the call, and we'll say it again. Number one, we're not emotional. Number two, we treat it like a business. Welcome to the Rent Prep for Landlords podcast. And now your hosts, Stephen White and Eric Worrell. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Rent Prep for Landlords. We got uh, Steve and I here. We're actually sitting shoulder to shoulder, which uh, we've never done for a podcast like this when we have a guest on. So I don't love it. Yeah, I it feels a little awkward. Yeah, just you know, being. A bit. Yeah. <laughs> but I am excited about our guest today. We have Scott McPherson on from All County Franchise. Uh, Scott actually, his company reached out to us. They wanted to be on the podcast because they have a lot of experience with not only property management, but helping people get into property management. So what we're going to do is we're going to pick Scott's brain a little bit. But first, I'd like to hear a little bit of backstory about All County Franchise. And Scott, thank you for being on the show. And uh, tell us a little bit about your business. Well, we're all county property management out of St. Petersburg, Florida. We started in 1990 managing assets for landlords. A lot like folks that listen to your audience. Uh, we facilitate the relationship for them, finding and placing the tenant, coordinating rent collection, coordinating maintenance, uh, the whole nine yards. I've been doing that for quite a bit of time, long before it was a cool thing to do. Mm-hmm. I never thought when I started this, I never thought I'd see the day that there would be a podcast or a radio show or anything that anybody cared to even listen about it. But it's an industry that uh, has had a lot of light on it in the last few years, uh, especially since we started franchising, which is kind of a timely thing. Uh, We started franchising in 2008. Uh, It occurred because we had grown our property management business in Florida um, to a point where and developed systems and procedures so that we could really manage it from a distance. And we were really kind of uh, my wife, Sandy, who uh, is co-founder, uh, we were kind of bored with ourselves. We had the business running like a well-oiled machine. We call it a property management ballet, and we were looking for other things to do. And uh, there was this cool new thing about advertising rentals on the Internet. That goes to show how far back this goes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I uh, built a website. It was quickrents.com, and it was a website so landlords and realtors and property managers could market and advertise their vacancies online which was a novel idea at the time. And we launched it in 2007, I think it was, in Las Vegas at the NAR conference and had a huge reception. Uh, But the interesting thing was, is we were advertising this founded by property managers. And through the course of this show, we had multiple inquiries where people said, can you sell us a franchise? Well, we had never really thought of that. so we left that show and really started tossing it around. And, and within like a month or two, we were on planes flying around the country with franchise consultants talking to them about who we were and what we did. Nobody really franchised that kind of concept at that point in time. Property management, um, we used to like to say it was the redhead, redheaded stepchild of the real estate industry. Nobody wanted to touch it. It was the dark side. We've always said that about tenant screening, I feel like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's the thing, you know, people people want the money. They don't want to do the management and the screening. Yeah, you know? they, they, they and you know, there's some realtors that did lease-only work, and they throw them in the MLS for their buddy or their friend to, to help them find a tenant, but they certainly didn't want to manage it because they had all the horror stories and things that everybody hears, right? So we run around and bounced ideas around, and it took us about a year uh, conceptually to put the process together. Uh, but we granted our first franchise location in 2009 in Atlanta, Georgia, and kind of the rest is history. We've kind of grown from there. It's been fascinating over the last 10 years almost now because, again, when we franchised, we had one other competitor. And uh, this gentleman that I knew in the um, property management industry came by and he says, you guys are talking about franchising. Are you nuts? He says, there's this other guy that um, has been trying to do that for years and property management. I need to take you over so you can meet him. So they take me over to his booth and I looked at the booth. It was like this eight foot banquet table with this floppy banner hanging there and there was no staff at it. And I said to myself, well, that's our competition. I know what our next step is, right? Um, So that's kind of our, in a nutshell, the the short story. Obviously the quickrents.com, we were really proud of at the time, but nobody told us about this little company out in San Francisco called Craigslist. Uh, mm-hmm. It would have saved me a lot of time, energy, and aggravation if I'd have known that that was l- like lurking on the West Coast. Uh, so Quick Rinse never really took off very far, uh, but it was kind of what planted the seed to get us to where we are today. And uh, so, I mean, these days what we do is we help individuals 
from all walks of life, which is one of the exciting things about it, that come to us looking for a new career. They're looking to go into business. Uh, they find property management interesting because maybe they owned a rental or they um, had had a real estate license years ago, but never did anything with it. But they found themselves at this point in their life where they want to do something that's their own, but they need help. And that's what mm -hmm. we offer them is, a, you know, they're in business for themselves, but they're not by themselves. I like to say that um, our franchisees, when they come to visit us and we're kind of going through the recruitment process, is it's not it's not your typical franchise. It's not a restaurant. It's not a pizzeria. It's not um, something like that where you can develop some cue cards and some pictures and hire some kids in high school to come um, follow the steps. Uh, it's a process that we take them through for years. Our franchisees that have been with us for nine years now, we still support them on a daily basis. Um, the education process never ends because there's a lot to what we do. And for you to do it well, you have to follow specific systems uh, and, and manage the flow and the people so that you can do it effectively in a large volume. So I'm curious, uh, I don't, I, mean, I forgive me if you already said this, but uh, how many franchises are you at right now? And then how many, like, what's your region? I mean, you all over the U S or is it kind of just close to where you are? Or? Great question. We're at 49 locations, I believe. Uh, I, I, I try hard not to count. I try to count in tens, but I think it's exactly 49, something like that. Uh, we're all over. I think we're in 15 States uh, from my last count from California, New York state, uh, Georgia, uh, Colorado, Arizona, uh, Washington state, Massachusetts. So it's kind of like all across the spectrum. Uh, yep. You know, this day and age with internet marketing, it's not like the old days where you could focus in one area. It kind of comes from where it comes from. Texas. Yeah, sure. uh, our biggest presence obviously is in Florida. Um, I mean, which is logical. I think people felt more comfortable with us being in Florida that we were right there next to them to help them out. But we're across the country. So you mentioned recruitment. I'm curious, what uh, what characteristics, what traits, what skills make the best property managers? Somebody that can manage their time. They don't get caught up in the minutia and the details. Uh, they can learn to take the emotion out of it, but most importantly, follow a system and follow a marketing plan. Uh, property management is not rocket science. I, I've always said it's it's kind of like juggling a lot of balls. And in the process and, and throughout the month and the life of a property manager, the goal is to keep as many of those balls in the air. But the reality is a few of them are going to hit the ground. It, it's how you manage it when they hit the ground that's going to determine whether or not you're good at this. But to get back to answering your question directly is follow a plan, follow a marketing plan, and, and be able to take the emotion out of it so that you don't get caught up in the day-to-day. -day. That's such great advice. I mean, we see it day in and day out here. Um, I think our top two pieces of advice that we give landlords on a daily basis is take the emotion out of it and treat it like a business. So have a process in place. And I think for a lot of landlords, that's a struggling point because they go into managing their own properties, not treating it like a business, or they're renting out the house they used to live in. So there's that emotional attachment there. Um, and I think that's the, the probably the, the best piece of advice any landlord can get who's managing their own, or certainly anybody who's looking to get into property management or might be considering a franchise. Yeah, when we uh, bring folks in for training, they come here for a training at a corporate headquarters for about a week. And uh, one of the first things we do, I, I wish I had the neon light, but it's there's no emotion in property management. There's no emotion in <laughs> property management. We kind of brainwash them as much as we can. But the, yeah. the reality is the best way to look at it is that we have to explain to them, you know, if you pick up a property that a landlord's had a tenant in and he's had it and he's over it and you've got to go in there and pick up the pieces and fix it. When you walk into that house, that tenant's left, um, the house is not trashed. It's not a disaster. It's not disgusting. It's not ruined and destroyed. It's not a lost cause. You walk into it with a non-emotional business standpoint that you walk in and look around and say, okay, we need a call or a hauling company. They're going to come out here for about 150 bucks, empty this house out. We're going to get the painter in to clean it up and we're going to clean the carpets. That's what we tell the landlord because that's the reality of it. It's very easy to get caught up in the motion and say that this is a lost cause, but it's not. Um, if you look at it black and white from a business standpoint, uh, there's just three or four steps we have to go through. And in a matter of a couple of weeks, it's back up for rent. Right. And you're right. That's uh, one of the biggest struggles that I think landlords have, especially if they're renting out a home that they stayed in, that they lived in in the past. There's a, a yeah. lot of 
history and attachment to it. But what you have to learn to look at is it's a long-term investment. It is no longer your home. Most of us never move backwards in life uh, unless if we're forced to for some circumstance that we don't foresee. Uh, We're always moving forward. And in the years that I've done this, of all the landlords that have come to us and said, I need you to manage my home. I'm being transferred, but we're going to be back. They don't come back. You know, maybe a handful have. uh, (laughs) But if they do come back, they buy a bigger, nicer house. They don't come back to live in the house. They turn into a rental. And and I think that's a hard pill to swallow in the beginning. But that's what our job is, is to help them make it through the process of becoming, going from a, a homeowner to all of a sudden, I'm a real estate investor because I've just rented up my right. home to function as a business long term. It's an asset that we're trying to manage to perform to its highest ability, um, gain the maximum profit we can form out of that asset. No different than a stockbroker wants to do with your stock portfolio. And when you start taking that mindset and you stop looking at it as real estate and you stop looking at it as your home, but you look at it as an investment and how do we get this sucker to perform? Uh, it becomes an easier road to understand. Yeah, I'll tell you a, a quick, a great story. Uh, didn't happen too long ago where, I don't know, a screener took a phone call from a landlord and this landlord was all upset and uh, needed somebody to talk to. And so the screener gets me on the phone and says, hey, this landlord really is just in a full-blown panic. So, uh, she, you know, the, she's so upset that these tenants ruined her door. And uh, she needs to talk to somebody. I said, ruin the door. Why would she need to talk to somebody about ruining a door? I get a whole I, I get on the phone and this lady's so upset and she's telling me they've ruined my three thousand dollar door. And I said, well, wait a minute. Why do you have a three thousand dollar door on a rental property? What I, I don't understand what kind of a door this is that you're even talking. about. I don't about. have a three thousand. I don't know if I have a three hundred dollar door on my, <laughs> on my home. <laughs> well, this was like some custom door with like stained glass. But it was a house that she used to live in. And so she had that emotional attachment that everything in that house means something to me. And now you're ruining my property, you know? So it uh, happens all the time. We have, yeah, we see it time and time. We we have a clause in our management agreement that um, new franchisees and their staff, they stumble across it and they don't know what to do with it. And it's basically an inspection list. And it basically says that if you're going to leave anything behind in the home of value, pool table, lawn furniture, chandelier, um, you need to provide us a list of what it is, what those items are, and what their value is. Otherwise, we're going to charge you to go in and make a list. The purpose of the clause is that we don't want a list, and we really don't want to go make a list and charge for it. We don't want them to leave the things behind because it's always sure. that person that says, I don't want the pool table. I don't care about the pool table. I don't want to move it. Can you just run it with it in there? And we say, okay, but you know, things happen. Oh, it's no big deal. And it never fails. The first year a tenant moves out, the belt's torn up and they come in and they want us to charge the tenant, you know, three thousand dollars for this pool table that they never wanted to begin with because now we've become emotion about it, emotional about it. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> but you you really gotta learn to take those things out. It's an investment. It's not yep. it's not your home anymore. And it's just a process to get through. And it's a it's a learning and a training process. And one thing uh, the start of what you said is if I can give anybody advice out there other than come to us for help. It's if you're going to be a landlord, do not give out your cell phone number. It, that's number yeah. that is rule number 1. If you want to be miserable and running out your property, give out your cell phone number because it's going to ruin the whole process. You have to manage yeah. the flow, you have to manage the relationship and if they're calling you and they have your phone number, they can text you at all hours of the night. You, your family, everybody's going to be miserable because you're. It's always going to be Saturday night with the family out. Get that that phone call. Well, we've had uh, a couple guests that have said something similar. I know uh, one was uh, Lee McCarran out in the uh, West Coast, and he was talking about he always uses Google Voice for his property management company. What do you recommend to people instead of using their cell phone? Uh, we use a um, VoIP system internally through our office. And uh, it routes to cell phones, but we don't give out the phone number. You know, it used to be, yep. you know, this is really dating myself, but I used to be on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week with a pager on my side. And, 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 you know, your friends thought that you were like in a different business, you know, but it was really this pager that was going off all the time for my air conditioner doesn't work and this doesn't work and I'm locked out of my house. And with this pager on the side, you had this phone number, you were forced to call them back. You would go in blind. You didn't know what the problem was, but you had this number and you had to call them. 
that's horrible for anxiety. Oh my God. Yeah. I, I can imagine, you know, you get the buzz and you, you know, who knows what it could be. And the sad thing is, is in, in all my years of doing this, I can count on one hand how many times there was a real actual emergency. Sure, and the reality sure. is when there is an emergency, there's nothing you can do about it. The fire department's taking care of it. The police are taking yeah. care of it. You know, when the car drove through one of our apartment complexes at four in the morning, the pager is not doing them any good. Uh, right, right, <laughs> yeah. you're, you don't need to be there. It's not something you need right. to jump in your car and go deal with right then and there. But today with technology, things have changed. We use a VoIP system. So it comes in a message, comes into our email. It's on those silly smartphones that we have. You can look at it. It interprets it. So you don't even have to listen to the message. You know, you can look at it yep. and say, oh, that's a shame. Their air conditioner is out. We'll call them on Monday. You don't even call them back. Um, right. It's managing the flow and managing the relationship and, and not being so reactive. Gotcha. Uh, if you have somebody who's listening and they've already, they already have a property management company uh, right now, uh, but they want to grow it. I mean, what would your advice be to somebody like that who's looking to grow the amount of doors that they're managing as a property ma manager? You really have to look, sit back and look at what you're doing and ask yourself the question, is this scalable? Can we scale this business? Can we do what we're doing now and get to where we want to go? And for our franchisees, there's very few of us that came to us and said, I want to be a property manager. They came to us and said they wanted to own a property management business. And what does that mean? It means that if you're out there and you own a property management company and you can actually look at people in the eye and say that you're a property manager, you've got it wrong. You've, you've, you've stepped into it in the wrong direction and you need to take a look back and take it to 30,000 foot view and say, how am I going to ever manage a thousand units, 1500 units, if I'm doing what I'm doing today? And the reality is you can't. And that's what we bring to our franchisees. It's, it's a different perspective. There's no magic sauce. It's, it's years of experience and understanding how to run a business that facilitates that relationship that does property management. We're not property managers. I can, I can happily say, but I haven't told anybody that I was a property manager in nearly 15 years because that's not what I do anymore. I don't know our owners. I don't know our tenants, but I know where we stand on a monthly basis. I know where we are on our P&L. I know when I run a balance sheet, how my business is performing. Uh, it's a simple report. It's, it's data. I mean, this day and age with software, if you're a property manager and you're doing inspections, taking pictures, carrying a being on call, answering tenant phone calls and, and dealing with owner's issues and facilitating all these things, uh, you're not a business owner. You're a property manager. You need to be able to step back and use the tools that are available today to measure yourself, measure your staff. You know, what are my receivables? That's all you need to know. You don't need to know that um, Tom, Sue or down the street hasn't paid their rent and they're 30 days behind. What you need to know is what your outstanding receivables are and what is that costing you? I mean. If your management fee is 10% and you have $25,000 in outstanding receivables on the 15th of the month, uh, what does that mean to your bottom line? You know, what, what, is, what are you leaving on the table? And those are things that you have to learn to do, not manage property. I'm, right. uh, I'm curious, is, have you found like a certain number or range that people get to where they kind of, uh, their ceiling is just reached because they don't have the right process to scale? I mean, what does that number of doors look like typically? How many times have you people? asked that question? Um, I, I haven't actually, no, it's funny. I, so. yeah. I get that we all do the, get time. the question from people. Yeah. That are, uh, they're, they're trying to get to the next level of doors. And we've noticed that we've had two types of property managers. There's ones you're describing where they have a thousand units and you're like, all right, something different's happening over there. Or there's one that they have 75, a hundred, or maybe a little bit more than that. But I was curious what that ceiling is for that, that property manager that hasn't figured out how to run it as a business. I'll, I'll give, I'll give you an answer and I'll give you a comparison to show you the difference. I have okay. found um, through my experience that a typical individual can get to about 80 to 120 units, depending on their demographic and their region, obviously, is that variable, before they really start pulling their hair out. Um, what we do here, when I was a property manager, I managed a portfolio of 800 units. Okay. And we did that myself and my wife, Sandy, we did that together. Uh, for a number of years with the help of one assistant back in the office, 800 units. Uh, it, and we did it and made it look easy. That was when we got bored and we decided to go build this website and compete with Craigslist. And it all comes down to system procedures. Why do they get stuck at 100 units? Well, they don't have a calendar in front of them. 
They're not following a plan. They're not consistent in everything they do. Uh, we give all of our tenants the same thing. We don't make exceptions. The rent's due on the same day. The late fees are the same thing. The late period is the same exact thing. We inspect on the same days. Every week, the folks that work for us know what they need to do every day. Uh, I mm -hmm. call it property management groundhog day. You know, it just happens <laughs> over and over and over again. It's not a day in the life. It's a month in the life. Every month, we get to start over doing what we did the month before. So if you didn't perfect it in January, you get the chance to do it again in February, March, April until you get it right. And that means following a plan. What day are you going to go out in the field and do your inspections? It, it's uh, For us, it's Thursday. Every Thursday, we visit every vacant property that we have. Why? We want to know if the vendors have done what they're supposed to do. Are there any issues? Is the lockbox working? Is the sign still up? Um, is it ready? Is it still clean? Those are the things you have to know. And if you're reactive to your problems, you could do that five days a week. But if you have a plan that mm -hmm. you're going to go visit those properties every Thursday, that is what you do. And then on Friday, you can intelligently speak to your owners that have a vacancy and say to them, okay, we've had X number of calls. We've had X number of inquiries, applications. I've been to the property. This is where we are. Um, we, we haven't had an approved tenant that was of quality and we haven't had somebody that's wanted. It's price, condition, location. I can tell you the condition. I was just there. We can't move right. the property. So what's next to do? We got to look at price because we don't dictate the price of rentals either. I don't get to do it. My owners don't get to do it. The market does. Uh, the, the potential tenants out there are going to tell you what your house rents for. But that's one thing you can get out of just specifically doing one thing every week. Inspect your mm -hmm. vacant properties on a specific day for a reason and a purpose, and it solves a lot of issues. If you don't do that and you just let it go because you say, I don't have the time, I'm too caught up and I can't get out there and do that, what's going to happen? The property is not going to rent. Your owner is not going to be happy. They're going to be calling. It increases the call volume to the office because when you have a vacancy, that's what causes your office phone to ring. So then you have all these inquiries, which your receptionist is having to deal with. And then the worst thing that ever could happen happens, you rent it to somebody that you wouldn't usually take for the home because yeah. it wasn't ready. It was overpriced. And it's the, it's the buy here, pay here philosophy in the United States. Somebody yeah. that's not qualified will pay far more for something than what they should physically pay for it. So you put them in the home. It wasn't yeah. ready because you didn't do your inspections. They moved in. They're submitting maintenance requests. So now you're clogging up your front desk again. And you're having to get on the phone with the owners to say, we need to fix this, this, and this. The owner's not happy now because now he's got more expenses. And then the first of the next month comes and they don't pay rent. You know, it, it's, I call it a chain that hangs over property managers' heads. And every link is a valuable step. And that first step is the vacancy. And if you don't handle the vacancy right, you might as well cut that link and let the rest fall on your head because that's what's going to happen. It's a great, great insight. I could tell you got a lot of experience there because you're, I think you're speaking directly to our audience on a lot of that stuff where, you know, um, you just hear them run into the same issues or you hear a lot of the same problems come up. And it's, you know, it's exactly what you mentioned there, where if if you're not addressing that first chain, everything else falls down underneath it or, you know, behind it. So great point there for sure. Yeah. And I would say, too, uh, going back to the emotion of it, that's probably a problem that some landlords fall into with the pricing. Where it's like, no, 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 I know that this property is worth this much. Yeah. And if the market says it's not, right. you're just kind of doing yourself a disservice by not getting good applicants and not getting the quantity that you need to find a good tenant. It's, it's having the confidence in what you do to convey a message. The reality is they come to you for a reason. You're the professional. Uh, they yeah. didn't come to you because they know what they need to do. They came to you because they need help. And the reality is, is that we don't set the rent and they don't either. The market does. Unfortunately... Mm -hmm. Um, with some of your websites out there, everybody knows the website. Every owner that comes to you has gone on it and sees what their house should rent for. It's this magical number the internet gave you. And unfortunately, right. I learned, I, it took me a while to figure out where some of the strange numbers were coming from, but there's a range down in the bottom in small print. And yeah. I can tell you when any lead call comes into our office and I ask the owner, so what are you looking to get out of the property? I know the answer before they ever say it because they're always going to say either what the site said are the max and the range. Those are the two numbers. The only two numbers. Right. <laughs> and, uh, right. Yeah. and what you have to be able to convey to them and what the landlord needs to understand is, okay, we can try anything. That's the beautiful thing about technology and what we do. We can throw anything out there um, and give it a, 
That's right. Because I've been wrong before many times. But after mm-hmm. a week, if we're not getting the inquiries, we're not getting the quality inquiries, there's a problem. It's price, condition, or location. And you need to be prepared to make a change. So what I always do is say, okay, I think that your number is doable, but I really see the property not at fifteen hundred dollars a month, but I'm thinking it's probably worth somewhere more between like eleven fifty and fourteen fifty. So I try to right. touch their number if I think it's unrealistic, but give them a range to set up expectations. Right. Right. Nice. I like that. I like the fact you give them the range. They're like, well, he said the number I wanted, but I could see how I can work down <laughs> yeah, from that. Yeah, yeah. You, you got to give them what you want if you want to win. But at the end of the day, yeah. you have to educate them that if it's not working, you hired me to do a job and you're going to have to listen, listen to me next week. Right, Otherwise, right. you're not going to get what you want. I'm not going to get what I want. And we're all wasting our time. So you, you make a good point that sometimes landlords have unrealistic expectations. And I know a big argument that a lot of landlords in our community have um, – or just sort of this this point of they don't really know at what point should I use a property manager? Do I want to self-manage? Do I want to go out and pay the property manager? So many landlords are penny pinching in the sense that they think they're saving a ton of money by self-managing and they're just they're destroying themselves, you know, brick by brick. But can you just give us some logical reasons why a landlord might consider using a property management company instead of self-managing? Well, we started out in the call and we'll say it again. Number one, we're not emotional. Yep. Number two, we treat it like a business. The reality is, is it's like anything else in life, right? When we go to buy the house, if it's worth 500, we think it's worth 300 because that's all we're willing to pay. The minute you walk through the door, all of a sudden it's worth 750. You tell all your friends, I got the great deal on this house and it's now worth 750. Everybody always thinks what they have is worth more than it really is to begin with. So that's the answer. That's human nature. Um, I'm no different. I'm going to tell you that my house is worth far more than somebody else's because I want it to be that. But what you have to recognize is there's a reality to what the market will bear. But to answer your question about doing it yourself compared to hiring a good property manager, the reality is, is that a good property manager will never cost you money. They're going to make you money. With decreased vacancy time, decreased cost to maintain, um, increased exposure, re- reduced liability. I mean, what most people don't realize that got into property manager and this property management and for your independent landlords, we live in a very litigious society. Yeah. And if you do not have the property insurance underneath your belt, you are setting yourself up for serious exposure. If you're the person that does not understand the laws, and I'm not just talking fair housing. It's fair debt yeah. collect, collection practices yep. act. Um, yep. If you do not understand those and what you're doing, if you're making phone calls to collect rent, uh, you're exposing yourself to a very costly venture. We once yep. picked up a property that was 52 units. And we picked it up because they were being sued for fair housing because they were asking this individual to leave the complex. And whatever their reasons were, we got in there and we went and sat down with her and we said, look, you know, what is the issue? What is it going to take to make this go away? And she says, all I want to do is stay in this unit until my kids graduate high school because it's in the school zone that they're in. After that, I don't even want to live here anymore. We gave it to Mm -hmm. her. We made it go away. But what that owner was facing was a lawsuit that would have cost them the entire 52 units because guess what? They self-insured. And Uh. even if you do have insurance, it doesn't necessarily cover those federal things. Um, any property manager out there that has um, errors and emissions, I hope you all do, because if you don't, you're not representing your owner very well. You know that your errors and emissions is capped on those things. Right. So a good property manager is always going to make that landlord far more money in the long run. Our job is to maximize their rate of return. We only get paid when they get paid. Um, and that's why we believe at All County, we don't mark up maintenance and repairs. Um, I, I don't understand property managers that want to go out and mark up every maintenance and repair owner has. That is our job. That's the core right. of what we do is to facilitate these things. And if you're marking up every repair or you're running your own handyman company to do the repairs in your owner's home, in your mind, you might be able to rationalize that you're doing them a favor. But the reality is, is how can you have a fiduciary relationship with your landlord if every time the tenant calls and says their toilet's leaking, that you're profiting off of that repair? You can't. It's not physically possible. 
So as one advice I will give landlords, if you're looking to hire a property manager and you call around and all you're asking is what is your management fee, um, you are shooting yourself in the foot because I know what it takes to run this business and those companies that want to do it for a flat rate of $69 or whatever it is, they have to make their money somewhere. Where are they doing right. it? Um, if they're cutting the rate, say you're uh, you're at 10% and, and these people are telling you they'll do it for seven, they want to run over the 7% because they think it's cheaper. But where are they making up for it? And that is one thing that we've always tried to stick to here at All County, even as we've grown and franchised and we have outside influences and franchisees that want to do you know, some of the things their way, is that we stick to all we charge these owners is a leasing fee, a management fee, and a renewal fee. We do not profit off of uh, their expenses in any way, shape, or form, and we maximize the rate of the return for their properties. Well, I would think too that that would probably uh, help you uh, get around uncomfortable conversations later on, where somebody signs on with the property manager, and then you know, like two months, three months later, they're like, "Wait, why was this so expensive to get this repair done?" Because maybe they didn't read all the fine print, and then it's a conversation that you're having to navigate with a new client, where you sounds like you just have a simpler system set up where it's pretty black and white that way. Yeah, it's a. Uh- it, it, it makes very uncomfortable situation. And I'll, I'll give everybody an example. Uh, we have a client we've managed for, for um, actually, heck, nearly the whole 30 years that all counties been, been in existence. And in the early days, uh, my wife's father had a handyman company. And with this investor's portfolio was so large, they decided that it was best for him to come in. He was looking for he was a displaced corporate executive. You know, at that age, what am I going to do with myself? He decided he was going to be a handyman and, and take care of all the maintenance on these units. Well, they did that for over 10 years. Um, he did a great job. The owner knew it was her father. Uh, he was completely happy with it. Uh, when he unfortunately passed away, I was stuck with what to do with this maintenance company, right? We had He had all these employees. Um, he had his wife that he left behind that he was worried about. And we agreed and we told him that we would maintain it for at least a year and see how it went. So we took off managing this maintenance company. And I'm telling you the story because I don't want to sound hypocritical. I've I've experienced it all. We've tried everything. Um, I don't just say it because um, I've never tried it. So for a year, I managed that maintenance company and coordinated those individuals. And at the end of the year, the owner came to the town for his annual visit. And for the first time in the history of him being a client, he was jumping up and down at the cost of all of his repairs. You see, it was no longer her father. It was us doing it. And he yeah. felt that everything we did was too expensive. And even though I explained to him that I, I had a Home Depot bill with like $20,000 on it that I didn't really know where to expense out because I was trying to be fair and I've been trying to figure out a way to solve that problem, um, he didn't buy into it. So we had to dissolve that company. And I can tell you, I would never go back and do it again because property management is an amazing business. Um, if you do it right and you follow the systems that we have and you follow the procedures, take the motion out of it, you can generate a nice r- residual income for yourself that's going to show up every month stress-free um, and you're going to enjoy what you do. You cloud that with 10 $12 an hour handymen that have the cocktail flu every Monday and expensing and billing and invoicing for all these repairs, you might as well shoot yourself. I said at the end of the year, we should have written her a check for her entire wage for the year that he wanted her to have. I should have given a check to every handyman for $10,000 that he had to make him happy and called it a day. It would have cost me far less money because I lost more in business relationships that took me years to recover and expenses that I couldn't feel comfortable billing out um, that it just never made up for it. So it's just not worth it. I, I don't. I don't understand that side. Right. Yeah, great point. Yeah. So Scott, if uh, somebody's listening and they're they're thinking about getting into property management, I mean, what would you tell them uh, as far as getting started? And then, uh, what do they do? Just reach out to your website, or I mean, what's the best way for them to get in contact with you? Um, they can contact us through the website. It's allcountyfranchise.com. Um, there's a lot of information there. It's a great place to get started. The biggest thing I can say is. We don't sell franchises, and that's one of the things anybody out there listening that's interested in coming to us um, needs to understand. We recruit franchisees. Um, Again, you ask me what makes a successful property manager a successful franchise, and that's somebody that's going to follow systems. They're going to follow the plan. They're going to take the motion out of it. 
And that's what we kind of do through the recruitment process. We want to find out, are these individuals going to work with us? Are they like-minded? That doesn't mean that we have to have all the same beliefs, but we need to be able to sit around a table, break bread, and have the tough conversations uh, when you're having issues in the office. So we really work to find people that are on the same page with us, that have the same common ground to get to where we're going. There's a reason we have 50 locations and not 200. Uh, our, our goal one day is to have 500. That is what we always set out to do. But what we found was, is we're not to throw it at the wall and see what sticks kind of company. We don't want to put on 50 franchisees a year so that we can have 30 fail and maybe have 20 that are successful or even worse. Uh, we try to make sure they're successful when we bring them on. Uh, a really um, smart guy once told me in the banking industry, loans never go bad. They're made bad. And to me, in the franchising business, it's the same thing. Franchisees don't go bad and they're not unsuccessful. They're made bad. You took them in for the wrong reason. You took them in because you wanted the franchise fee. You took them in because it was too easy or it was too hard to say no. Um, for us, we've had an amazing success rate. We have a great track record. Um, we have had a couple failures. But I can honestly say those franchisees didn't fail on their own. They failed because we allowed them to become a franchisee to begin with. When they right. came to us and we were questioning and saying, no, it's not going to work that way. They were saying, yes, we want to do this. And instead of just putting the brakes on and saying, hey, this isn't a good fit, we did it anyway. We all made those right. mistakes and we learned. So we have a couple that didn't work out and it's unfortunate, but we learned from it. And I recognize that it was our fault. We put them into a situation we knew wasn't successful, and that's what we work hard not to do. Um, but yeah, allcountyfranchise.com, um, or they can give our office a call. It's a uh, simple number. It's 855-245-7368. So it's 855-245-RENT. Yeah, and we'll uh, we'll put all that information, too, into the show notes on our site. And uh, we'll, we'll uh, definitely put this up in the uh, Facebook group because uh, I know we've got a lot of people that have been interested in making that leap to becoming a property manager or whether or not they should hire a property manager. So, mm-hmm. uh, Scott, thanks for being on the uh, the episode here. Uh, tons of insights. Like you're saying, you've done it. <laughs> so you had the experience to pull from. That's very apparent. And uh, thank you for your insights and uh, the experience and uh, answering some of these questions. My pleasure. And anything I can ever do for you guys, just let me know. All right. Will do. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Scott.